The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, Where did this man get all of this? What kind of wisdom has been given to him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place, and among his own kin, and in his own house. So he was not able to form any mighty deed there, apart from curing a few sick people by laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. like to teach you a prayer today that I want you to take with you and maybe repeat during the week and that prayer is I'm going to repeat it Jesus give me the faith to move every mountain in your creation beginning with the mountains in my own heart and then the mountains in other people's hearts I'm going to say that again Jesus, give me the grace to move every mountain in your creation, beginning with the mountains in my own heart and then the mountains in other people's hearts. One more time. Jesus, give me the faith to move every mountain in your creation, beginning with the mountains in my own heart and then the mountains in other people's hearts. Last Sunday, we had two gospel miracles in the gospel if you remember it was the healing of the woman with a hemorrhage and followed by the little girl who died who was 12 years old and in both of those cases do you remember that that there was great faith wasn't there the woman said if I can just touch his garment I'll be healed and her faith saved her and then the father of the little girl when they brought word uh, that the little girl has died so don't bother the teacher anymore do you remember uh, and Jesus said to him, do not be afraid, just have faith. And he did have faith. And the little girl was raised from the dead. And so that was in strength. Those were places, towns that people didn't really know Jesus. But boy, great faith was rising, wasn't it? And then today he goes back to his own hometown of Capernaum, of Nazareth. And he starts to preach and teach. And people are saying, this is too much. We know who you are. You're one of us. Where did you get all this stuff? In other words, we don't believe in you. They even insulted him, do you know, by saying, we know that your mother is Mary. Well, you know, that's not an insult, is it? But for them it was because in Jewish times, you identified yourself with pride by your father. And to say that you were the the, the, the Mary was your mother was indicating that we don't know who your father is. It was a kind of way of insulting. And of course, they didn't have faith. And isn't that fascinating that last week when that woman touched his garment, it was almost like power poured out of Jesus almost to get without his permission. Do you remember? Uh, but he felt power come out of him because her faith was so strong and she was healed. And today it says that he was not able to do many miracles except lay his hands on a few people and heal them from their sickness. Faith is a very critical virtue in the Christian life, isn't it? We have to faith, we were given faith, if you remember from your baptism, 
Faith, hope, and charity are infused into your soul, right? That's why we call them uh, theological virtues. You can't get them on your own. They're gifts from God, and they pour into you in the moment of your baptism. Whether you're baptized as a baby or later in life, I didn't say that God can't give faith in other ways, but he pours faith, hope, and charity into us at our baptism. Our job then is to make those three virtues grow by practicing them, right? Lord, I believe, but increase my faith, right? And practice hope and charity as well. You know, a lot of times, young people today, in all our families, we, including my own, we have young people that will say, well, I don't go to church anymore, or I don't practice my faith, or, you know, I don't believe that, they may not say it this way, but I don't really believe that Jesus is the answer. Because I was raised Catholic, and I've tried, and he hasn't fixed all my problems, or he hasn't given me the happiness that I yearn for. Now we can say, well, the happiness we all yearn for, that to be completely fulfilled, that's only going to be in heaven, isn't it? We know that. And older people learn that because they've kind of experienced everything in the world. But when you're young, you still hope that you're going to find it somewhere out there. So what do you do? I've talked about it before. It's like throwing M&Ms in the Grand Canyon. Come on, keep going. You'll fill it up. You're never going to fill it up because inside your soul, the kapax dei, the capacity for God, is infinite, and you will never fill it with anything except Jesus. And older people learn that by default, by mistakes and suffering, don't we? And that's why most older people are in the church and not younger people. Are you with me? And a lot of times it's like Jesus coming back to Nazareth and saying, and everybody says, we know who you are. You're not the answer to my heart's aches. He is the answer. Jesus is the answer to which every human heart is the question. Not some human hearts, all human hearts. Every human person is made to be filled by Jesus. And he is the only answer but it can't force faith, right? What do we say? Uh, God ain't got no grandchildren. You ever heard that? It was a great little book by a Protestant pastor. I loved it. It said, God ain't got no grandchildren. What does that mean? That means you're not going to heaven because your mother is a saint. You're going to heaven because you find Jesus and you choose him and you choose to believe in him and to live your life for him in obedience to his teachings and his commandments. And you let him love on you. Jesus is the answer, but this world is not. And not that I don't love this world. Fourth of July week, I love my country. I'm a proud American. I love my country, but I fear for her because our country was founded to be one nation under God. And when you push God out, what happens? That What makes a country great? Great men and women. What makes men and women great? Jesus. Jesus makes men and women great because he teaches us virtue and we don't live expecting someone to give us things or, or, or unforgiving. We believe in hard work and honesty. Jesus teaches us those great virtues and that's what makes our country great. And so we're proud to be Americans, aren't we? And we love our country and we don't take it for granted. We thank God for our religious freedoms. And I've traveled enough around the world um, doing different things. Every time I come back, I'm so glad I, I'm, I'm, I'm American, that I belong to the United States. But patriotism is a great virtue, but it's not the highest virtue. What does patriotism mean? It means, generally speaking, a cultural attachment to one's homeland or devotions to one country. Patriotism is often an absent virtue in those who have not sacrificed for their nation. Have we all seen this? Many times the television comes on and there's an 85-year-old who fought in World War II and he's standing there with the American flag, right? And he's saluting and tears are coming down his cheeks. And then the camera spans to a 16-year-old young boy or girl, and they're playing with their, their iPhone. Oftentimes, patriotism is not present if we haven't sacrificed and suffered for our nation. 
And so loving our country means being willing to sacrifice. But as I said, the highest of all virtue, putting first things first, God first, and then country. Because when we put God first, then again, men and women become great. And when men and women become great, then our country becomes great. I love, um, you know, we're reading 2 Corinthians 12, and, and the second reading is one of my favorite, uh, St. Paul, talking about all that he sacrificed, all that he suffered. I mean, read, if you read 2 Corinthians 12, he made so, he suffered so much. He said that uh, five times at the hands of the Jews, I received 40 lashes minus one. 50 lashes was a death sentence, by the way. So 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I passed a night and a day on the deep. He said, I am in constant danger from rivers and robbers from my own race, from Gentiles, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers, through sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, cold and exposure. And apart from all of this is my anxiety for the churches. St. Paul suffered to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, didn't he? He made so many sacrifices. What a great man he was. And God asked us to make sacrifices as well. In our own milieu, right, our own circles of influence, to do everything in our power to put God back on his throne in our country. Because you see, as C.S. Lewis said, if you put first things first, second things will follow. But if you put second things first, you will lose both first and second things. God first, then country. And we love our country, don't we? But we pray that she will become more and more one nation under God. (laughs) What's your question? If we're going to have three, I would put them in that order. God, family, and country. (laughs) If we're going to have two, it's God first and then country. Let's say again our little prayer that I taught you. Dear Jesus, please give me the faith to move every mountain in your creation, beginning with the mountains in my own heart and then the mountains in other people's hearts. Amen.